Welcome to The Journey, Hopkinton Center for the Arts web series featuring gifted artists. The Journey is our opportunity to learn about their lives, about the people and influences and experiences that shaped them as artists, spurred them and inspired them along the way. Joining us today is the incredibly versatile and prolific actor, producer, director, photographer, and playwright Ntade Guma Mbaho Mwine. The Los Angeles Times listed Ntade as one of the biggest breakout stars of Sundance 2020 for his lead role in Equa Msange's film Farewell Amour. He is consistently singled out in publications like Variety and The Hollywood Reporter for his stunning work of great depth and intensity. He is a staple in prestigious projects with Oscar-winning directors and actors, films that dominate the top f- festival circuit. He shares the screen with artists like Lupita Nyong'o in Mira Nair's Queen of Katwe, Idris Elba in the upcoming Netflix film The Heart of They Fall, and Leonardo DiCaprio in Blood Diamond. And Tade has received multiple directing awards and nominations for his short films and features. His film Kuhani won the main prize for Best Achievement in Directing at the Oscar-qualifying International Kurzfilmtage Winterthur in Switzerland. He was nominated for the Grand Jury Prize for Best Short Film at Slamdance, and he is set to helm the upcoming documentary film on Ugandan student talk Chibate Aloysius Salongo, which Oscar winner Steven Soderbergh is executive producing. On television, Ntadi is best known as the complex anti-hero Ronnie in Lena Waithe's critically acclaimed Showtime series The Shy. You'll see him as the lead role on the series finale of HBO's Room 104 and in recurring roles on the Cinemax series The Nick, David Simon's Treme, Bosch on Amazon, and on NBC's Heroes. And Tari's very first effort as a playwright, Biro, a, a, a multimedia solo piece, uh, made its world premiere at Uganda's National Theater and subsequently premiered in London and in New York City at the Joseph Papp Public Theater, where it made the New York Times Critics Pick List. His photographic work has been featured in Vanity Fair, exhibited in galleries across the globe, and has been even featured on HBO's Six Feet Under, which I didn't know until fairly recently. I'm going to go back and look at that. Despite his global renown, he was born right up the road in Hanover, New Hampshire, and he is a dual citizen of Uganda and the United States. And Tade Guma Mbahumwine, welcome to the journey. Thank Thank you, you, buddy. Thank you for this incredible welcome. Thank you for having me. And it's so great to see you after all these years. I know. Uh, I don't know. You forgot to mention in this in your bio that we were, were running around together in tights for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Literally in tights for three years. I was I was going to give a, a little disclaimer of my own today. I was going to come clean about that because you're not the only person I've hit up from our class. I love to brag about you guys. So and you're the most interesting and great actors I know. So naturally, I gravitate toward having you on the show, man. You're one of the first people that I, I reached out to, and I, I was so glad you said yes and relieved. Thank so you, thank you, man. It the world to be here with you. Oh, thank you. And we have a small invited audience watching today, and they'll be asking some questions later in the show and more later on when we get this online and ready to go. And I was going to say, for the sake of transparency, yes, Antati is a classmate from NYU's graduate acting program. That's where we were running around in tights. We also had David, <laughs> David Zabel on the show recently, and some other people are going to be coming up soon, too. So we've known each other over 31 years, my friend. Wow. Can you believe that? Can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's a fact now. Point. It's a cold, hard fact of life. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're you're very, very kind, man. As you say, I, we we both got the old man glasses on now, but that's <laughs> such is life. It beats the alternative. You know, I, I've got I've got to say from the start, you and Tade were a standout at NYU, and also just in in the theater. Um, you know, even before you you sort of started to hit in film and television, you I always felt you had great not only personal style but just great. You were a great, compelling performer right from the the jump. Very self contained uh, and and just in confident. Uh, I I felt you were. Well, I don't know if you felt that way, but uh, I would just know that you. I would just see you. I remember even right from first year, you seemed to sort of when we'd be in an exercise in in class, you would sort of sit there to the side sort of in the shadows almost, and then pick your moment to jump in to a scene or an exercise at just the right moment. And everyone would just be blown away like, what the hell do we just see, you know? It was as if you 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 knew what you were looking for um, in, in these classes. Was that an instinct or do you, did you recognize that in yourself at the time? Um, no, I think I've just been someone who likes to observe a lot. And so, uh, as you mentioned, I spend a lot of my time observing. My mom tells a story about she took me to swimming lessons in 
Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, another thing we share in common, kind of yeah. in the Boston area. And uh, she said, I refused to get into the pool with the other kids. <laughs> and I just sat and watched. I sat and watched them do their lessons. And then after the lessons were over, I got in the pool and started doing the exercises on my own <laughs> and just taught myself how to swim. So I feel like that was wow. sort of how I've been just from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, man, that totally doesn't surprise me because I mean, there, there was a time, Antati, I don't know if you remember this, but you even had, it was almost like a little lair in, in one of the rooms, I forget exactly which one, at 721 Broadway, that's where our school is and, uh, and still is. But there was a, it was like a, I don't know if it was a cabin or, a, or sort of a, 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 a counter or something. And you would sort of sit back and wind up like sitting half in this cubby hole. And it was almost like you were like, and I realize now, like, and I, and I, you used to have a camera with you half the time yeah. too. And, and you'd be, every once in a while, I'd see you click away at a picture or something like else. And it was almost like you had us framed. <laughs> and I just thought, is, is this something about this? You know, visually, I know you were an observer um, of people generally, but, but of us in class and sort of, yeah, yeah. That, that's what was going on. It was, it, it actually got me in trouble because I was on probation for most of my time, I didn't mind you. you were like, why aren't you, <laughs> you participating know, more? Um, I, I hit that. I hit that mark for different reasons myself a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a struggle. I mean, I mean, the school, I, I always say, uh, I am so, so glad I went there. And some of my dearest friends are from that period of time and, and from mm -hmm. that place. And, and all the training, the, my sensibility as an artist, uh, my technique and skills as an actor, are all I have to attribute to oh, the teachers and the students, my classmates, mm -hmm. especially, um, I attribute to, to that experience, too. At the same time, I couldn't, I won't say I wouldn't, but I couldn't do a day of it over again. It was a really, it could be times, at times grueling, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the schedule was yeah. grueling, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I feel, especially for those guys who, you know, like Stan or who had families, I just don't know how right. you know, they pulled it off. Some, I teach now and there's some kids who, I don't know how they balance it all. So... Yeah. You know, people with families and spouses and partners and things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt that was one of the hardest things um, at NYU when I, and, and, you know, my Elaine and I met my wife um, and, and were married uh, right before our third year. And I, mm -hmm. I commuted in from Harrison, New York. I would commute mm -hmm. an hour and a half, an hour, 45 minutes each way. So mm -hmm. I missed out on all the people who were two years younger, all of their cabarets, all of their showcases and things. I didn't get to know them as actors. And yeah. I really, re you know, really regret that. At the same yeah. time, I'm pretty glad I'm married to the same woman 29 years later. <laughs> so, yes. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things that did you, did you feel um, when you were going to school, did you feel sort of isolated in a way and that because of that schedule, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think any sort of intensive... Uh... A conservatory program like that it's like being you know in medical school uh, yeah. in terms of the hours that you had to put in um, so it's it's it is it is pretty demanding schedule yeah um, yeah so it's only harder for students your students now I can imagine who are having to do some rigorous scheduling but all on this platform uh, yeah you know because yeah. it's if you're in person you can walk around you can shake it off you can you know but when you're sitting in front of your computer screen all day uh i feel for the students especially now because i teach as well and yeah. i know that's a challenge yeah can you t talk about your your teaching now because i know it's, it's something we've touched on in, in offline conversations here too but i'm sure people would be interested um i teach at usc and it's a class called free play and we basically just make short films so i basically created a class i wished we had had when we were in grad school which is kind of like a games class but incorporating the camera um it's basically to help demystify the camera for the kids mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, i think we had one camera class and i, I laughed the whole way through it because <laughs> it was like a soap, <laughs> soap opera they gave us soap opera material yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like some guy with a big like VHS camcorder. He <laughs> put a tape in, click. Then we had to come in and be like, <laughs> just deliver these horrible lines. I remember that, and I remember you breaking the whole time too. It was. I have that, tape. That was I still have my tape. I oh, you do? Yeah. Well, I don't think well, I took mine. 
I don't think I took mine. I, I, I remember just seeing myself in profile slumped over, just kind of trying to relax and just being slumped over. And I looked like Quasimodo. I said, yeah, you guys can keep it. I don't need to take that with me. <laughs> can we get rid of that? Yeah. I wish I had kept yours. I was, his prices oh, was back. My scene partner was Antoinette and she was brilliant because I was literally cracking up <laughs> the minute I walked into the scene. <laughs> just <I'm> like, <laughs> like, I was like, so what, I've got terminal stage four cancer. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> and she was just like centered and delivering the lines. Oh God, she, well, she's amazing anyway. I'm sure she just used it. I'm sure yeah. she just used it. She's always great at responding, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, it was that was that was one of the things. I mean, I think NYU. I think now that they've sort of addressed that, but yeah, yeah uh, I think it's something they kind of kept the purity of 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 theater um, in most of the training. But they said, oh yeah, well, there's some jobs out there in the soaps. The soaps aren't going anywhere. Let's train them to soap operas. They'll be soaps forever. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> look at us now. You know, yeah. But right. you know, I remember you having a, a, a video camera. In fact, fairly recently, you shared with the class uh, some videotape of our class in yeah. in, in our in our um, Paul Walker. Paul Walker, you know, that was incredible. Project, I just yeah. Look at that project to see him. And, uh, I mean, that was some magical times, and um, he was one of my favorite teachers. So Mine just to too. be able to have, have footage of just him, see to be able to see him. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And how young he looked. Uh, when we were school, younger than us, we're all, we're all old. <laughs> well, Ron Van Lu, Ron Van Lu was younger by a few years yeah. younger than me. You know, yeah, uh, I can't believe it. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. Ron Van Lu is to uh, uh, our friends know it is the uh, really the core of the program at the time. He was the the scene study uh, guru there, and there was the actor, uh, the, the acting teacher that I, I certainly and many people wanted to please. You know, between him and Paul Walker, I felt, and 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 for me, um, because I wound up doing some musicals too. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, Deb Lapidus. You know, the just three people that were really seminal in, in my training. But um, I just, I just know that Paul Walker was sort of, it was sort of like our infancy as actors. Our first year, we got to play with Paul Walker and allowed us to stretch our imaginations and take risks and, and really experiment without the burden of, uh, of, of text, you know, uh, yeah. scripted material. It was so great. And it's so amazing to see these videos that Ntare took and, and some photographs um, through the years while we were there. Every once in a while, he'll send a batch to all of us on a little text string that we started a few years ago. And it's it just blows my mind how young we all were. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And what is the class that you teach now? So right now I'm going to teach a couple of sections at Boston College of uh, Fundamentals of Acting. Uh, I've taught that there before. And this year will be different. You know, with all the limitations we have with coronavirus, we'll be uh, teaching. I'll be teaching with as much flexibility as I can in terms of attendance. That's sort of thing. We want the students to be able to feel like you can stay home and monitor it online or see a videotape of it later. But, you know, we usually will do something Paul Walker asked for the first third of this semester and, and sort of start out with those baby steps and all that fun. Uh, yeah. But it's such physical work uh, and it's just too risky to do in the environment that, that I'm going to be teaching. in. so we're going to go straight to monologues for now and then hopefully get to scene study, depending on, uh, you know, where the numbers are later in the semester. Right. Uh, but it's something that I can sort of retool and I, I will, heck, I'll, I'll just do, you know, I, I'm, I'm a private coach too. So I'll coach them all individually if I have to, to get yeah. them where I think they need to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. You know, teaching is that other thing. I don't know how you feel about it, but I mean, I know you've been doing it for a long time, so I'm sure you love it. Uh, for me, it's that other itch that I need to scratch. You know, it's mm -hmm. as, to me, it's as good as performing in that way to be able to yeah. explore. I love to rehearse. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is that something that still resonates for you in that way? Uh, I love it just because it feels like it keeps me connected to um, these fresh, you know, fresh kids who are just hungry, and uh, just to get in the room and play with them is is for me what makes it exciting. I don't even think of it as teaching, but just getting in the room and hanging out with these guys and mm -hmm. playing. Um, yeah, it keeps me on my toes. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. You know what? Um, I, I always was interested in, um, you know, the, the little bits about your background, you know, as we first got to know each other 30 years ago. Um, can you talk a little bit? Would you mind talking about a little bit about your family, sort of where you grew up specifically in, in your, your mom, your dad? Yeah. Sort of, I, sort of how the arts sort of drifted into your life or you drifted into the arts. I was born in Hanover, New Hampshire. When my dad was... Um, 
taken his final exam at Dartmouth College. So we were there basically for a few weeks or months after, because we got, he went to Harvard Law School after that. So I grew up in Cambridge for a little bit. Um, and I have lived in Brookline in the Boston area for a little while. And my first actual audition for anything was this television show called Zoom. Oh, you didn't know that. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're going to Zoom, 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 Zoom. Zoom. You're going to Zoom, 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 Zoom. Damn. How did it go? How, do, how was that? It was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get it? My mom, I don't know why she thought to bring me to this. Um, so basically, you get to this thing. I don't know. I don't think I expressed interest. I just watched the show, and I guess she saw maybe that they were having auditions. She thought it'd be good for me to go. Um, so we all get into a circle. All these kids get into a circle, and we're going around the circle, and everyone's like, "Just tell a story about yourself." And and like you know, the kid goes next, and another kid goes next. And they're all like bubbly, you know, television kids, just like. <laughs> and it comes to me, and I go, "Natani, can you share something?" And I just sat there. <laughs> quiet and they're like do you have any stories you want to tell not in silence and they i don't know how long they sat on me they went okay next jimmy <laughs> <laughs> that was it and what about the callback yeah. so how did the callback go <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i could tell i mean that's that's one of those things i would have a hard time imagining you there because you know i i do think you you sort of, you, not sort of, you, you maintained, I felt you maintained your sense of self through it all. I, you know, there were, there were some of us, you know, in, in training, there are students who will do anything to please the teacher, other people. You were there for your reasons. And I just felt that there was a, there was a real integrity about you. you there were things that you're just not going to do if you didn't believe them, you know? Uh, I, 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 I felt that way about you. And it's, it, you know, you, you start to your guns about moments in, in time. You, you would never expand it, anything to sort of make it big, you know, hit, you know, play for the, you know, for the, for the lights up in the back of the house or any of that stuff. I mean, you, your, your performing was always supported and connected and real. And whatever you did do uh, was so rooted in that. It was just, it was like, it was so human and so natural. There was, to me, it, it made no, it, it, it made complete sense that you would wind up um, not only doing plays, but, but moving into film and television. And failing miserably at the Zoom audition. And, and failing miserably at the Zoom audition. Well, you know, look at now, maybe they'd give you another shot at it. Too. Yeah, maybe they would. <laughs> but you have to work on your fossey hands, I think. <laughs> for sure. What do you think? So you, your mom, I mean, did you think she recognized something in you, an artistic impulse, yeah, or did I mean, you at the time? Really, she was really great. She took me to see uh, uh, all sorts of musicals, puppet shows. Like, she really exposed me to the arts at a young age, um, yeah. which I loved. Um, and I, my first audition for a play was actually at Pierce School in Brookline, Mass, uh, for the role of Peter Pan. Uh, which I didn't get. I got I got cast as a pirate somehow. Um, <laughs> that was my first first experience on stage. It was a school play uh, doing Peter Pan, um, and then just you know had never really done any plays in primary school or did any other theater, in in high school. Um, yeah, it was even like at NYU in high school. All my schooling, I've always been the minority. I've always been one of the few black kids in the school. And so that was also part of the challenge I think I had at NYU or at any of those schools is that they weren't, um, you know, I, they weren't necessarily catering towards uh, students of color's needs. Like we never did an all black production or, you know, they were, this is before they were doing, <clears throat> you know, August Wilson plays or, mm -hmm. uh, so, and I don't know if you remember when we were in a class once we had to learn how to do like an Irish or a Scottish accent. I was like, why am I, why can't I learn how to do like some accent that I'll be doing when I get out of school? Not that I won't be doing it, but something more likely. Why am I having to learn all these European accents and I can't do anything that I might have to do? 
Mm -hmm. um, but that was the same issue with, you know. I do remember that. Yeah, and there was a focus on sort of Eurocentric canon of work. And mm -hmm. So that was part of my sort of being an outsider because I was like, half of me was half in and half out because yeah. I was like, you know, uh, but I know they've changed a lot there. And right. just what I'm teaching here at, at USC, they've gone through a huge upheaval in terms of, you know, with this, with this recent sort of reawakening of social justice that sort of swept with that the result of, you know, these deaths that happened over the summer. Um, I'm sure, I'm not sure it's happened to your institution as well, but they've been re-examining um, pedagogy and to refocus only on white male uh, playwrights to produce, or do we get, look for other voices as well? Mm -hmm. um, so every step of the way in terms of like where I was at school, that was always something I was coming up against. And when I was an undergrad, we created our own theater group called the Robeson Players and we put up our own plays. Do you say the Robeson? Yeah, the Paul named Paul after Robeson? Paul, yeah, Paul yeah. Robeson, yeah. So we created right. this theater called the Robeson Players and we did, you know, plays that we could play the lead roles in. Um, and so that was basically what I got to do most of the stuff because when I, the only main lead role I had in undergrad was doing, was when I think I was in third year or fourth year um, where they did Raisin in the Sun. Mm -hmm. um, and even at NYU, I was always the old man or the old lady. Um, character, the old, all the old lady grandma. <laughs> right. You got you got all the lead roles, and I was the old yeah. man. Well, I was sh I was shaped like a leading man. I, I I have always considered myself as a character actor because uh, because I'm a creepy guy. Uh, but um, I I was sort of shaped like I resembled you know um, it was similar to a leading man. And I did get a lot of breaks that I saw a lot of my friends did not get. And, and after a while, I, 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 I realized it. And it was not about, it was obviously not about talent, you know, or ability. Um, it was about people's perceptions yeah. and what they're used to and what they're comfortable with. Um, you know, and I, I look at now where schools, including the institution that I'm at now, you know, work for uh, uh, academic institution, um, you know, everyone is struggling with who they have on staff now and who is there forever with tenure and, mm -hmm. and who they can bring in because it is not going to change with just the desire alone. It's going to change when people actually know the material and they're inspired and lived it, uh, the, that, that the faculty is actually representative of, of the population. Yeah, that, that's, that is, that, that's true. Um, and I'm glad to see that, you know, you recognize that even then at school and that it's something that you're addressing now because mm -hmm. it's it requires a change on all part i mean i i was called into our the head of our program's office and had many conversations like this and said what's because they had kicked out i don't know if you remember they had kicked out a black male student six years running every year uh, i wasn't and, aware of that yeah yeah and every yeah. year jeffrey wright being one of the most famous uh, and I was, and I was about to get kicked out. And I was like, "Do you think it's the problem? Is is maybe it's Pat? Is, is it with all of us, or is there something in the program that's missing that somehow is causing this disconnect?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's the, I think that's the thing that saved me from getting kicked out that time. Um, oh, so, good for you, man. Yeah, um, we, you know, it's, it's amazing to see it's thirty years later, and it's still, a, it's still a question that's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, and I don't know what the, you know, what the faculty is like um, at NYU United. It's been a while since I've been back there and met a lot of the people. There are a lot of people who've been there for years. There's a lot of new faces that, that I'm not familiar with. But um, I know there's a desire, even, even around, in the Boston area, too, because I live here um, and in the schools and when I'll be applying for positions as well. And so you see who is getting getting positions. There is an earnest effort around I think I'm hopeful that it's around the country, or at least in certain areas, certainly in New England, yeah. to actually to actually make that change so that um, that curriculums and seasons can be um, can cater to people of all of all races and ethnicities. Yeah. So. No, that makes total sense, and I think yeah. that it's definitely happening. And and I'm glad to see these conversations are happening. You know, yeah. even it even the fact that it even came up in this conversation just shows how you know. It's something that's on the forefront. 
you know, it's one of those things I, I, I have been curious about sort of your um, your thoughts on uh, things that have, uh, people refer to right now as the George Floyd uh, situation in some circles, you know, but it's it's about so like you said it perfectly, the awakening, the reawakening of social justice and, and that effort that we hope is just not uh, focused on one one incident, but this whole pattern, uh, uh, the, the historic patterns that we keep keep falling back into. Yeah. Um, and I realize, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. I'll, I'll be candid with you. I, I, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to be saying, you know, oh, I have an African American guest on on the show. I'm going to be asking them, give them a chance to talk about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and anybody else. You know, well, what if what if they have another focus for the day? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But it is it is something that is ever present out there. Uh, I think it is going to affect our industry. Um, in, in big way. I, I, I trust it and hope that it will affect our industry and that we're at an inflection point that means we are not going to go backward in time. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, that we're yeah. at an undeniable point where things are going to change and, and yes. the, the people have opportunity that didn't. Yeah. yeah. Yes. There's some incredible new voices coming out in theater and, and they're, they're pushing through regardless so these yeah. voices will be heard. Yeah, yeah. Regardless, it's going to happen. Yeah, it, it's going to happen. And I think people understand that now. You, you, we just can't ignore it. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, you know what? I, I think back on when your your time uh, in the years. Perhaps it was right at the on the tail end of of your your time at NYU. When, when did you go to Cuba? I remember you came back with photographs that you shared. Oh yeah. Us. Was that at I, the end of NYU or right after? No, I went there with my uh, uh, my ex-wife when I, she was from Cuba, Ina, mm-hmm. um, and we went there to visit her family, basically, and yeah. we fell in love with the place, and then went back and we got married there, and that was two thousand and one. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, two thousand one, and I, I somehow was able to see some of the photographs from that uh, experience. I mean. Did you? I, I remember just the way we did in Moscow when we went to to Stanislavski's Moscow Art Theater. You know, you always had a camera with you, and do you find that that's so? You you obviously you're looking at the world. You are an observer. You are observant, and you have your own unique perspective on the world. And some of the photographs, I, I still to this day can see photographs um, in my mind. Some of the images that you shared somehow with me. Kind of yeah, burned into my Dan psyche. Has, yeah. Stan has some of them in his place, I think. That may have been. That may have been it. Stan had some, yeah. Yeah, I've always been, uh, as if, so, if not more comfortable behind the camera than in front of it. Mm-hmm. So, I love shooting, and Cuba is one of those places where you just drop your camera and you take an incredible picture. Yeah, uh, <laughs> wrong, because um, it's just you know it's perfectly distressed. Uh, mm-hmm. But we had an incredible time. And uh, have you been at all? I've never been. No, it's definitely one of those places that I'd love to go. I mean, obviously now it's going to be uh, a little bit more likely, mm-hmm. you know, that, that I'll have the the I'll be allowed to go. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. yeah, I'd love to get there. Yeah, you will. Well, I have connections if you want. If you ever need any hookups or people, or... I will tap you for those connections, my friend. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so you, your connection, talk, if you can, talk about your connection to Uganda. I mean, I, I know there is some work that you're, you're doing uh, that's coming up uh, or yeah. that you've been doing perhaps uh, with a particular uh, photographer, Chibate Aloysius uh, Salongo. Um, yeah. If you could talk about that relationship and his legacy and, and this project that you've got going. Um, well, I'm a first generation Ugandan American, as you mentioned. So both of my parents are from Uganda and my parents' parents my parents, 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 and as far back uh, as from Uganda. So uh, it has been my muse in many ways. Um, my first play that I wrote was inspired by a Ugandan story. My photography was mostly stuff that I've shot in Uganda. So anytime I go home, I feel like inspired in a way that uh, to create. Um, and I, by chance, stumbled across um, Chibate's photo studio when my car broke down, like in a small town in the middle of nowhere, basically. And as I was passing time, you know, waiting for the car to get fixed, I stumbled across his photo studio. 
And his work I ended up incorporating into my multimedia solo play, Biro. And every time I'd go back to Uganda, I'd check in on him. And he had just thousands and thousands of medium format negatives. And they were black and white, and just amazing work. And I had promised that I was going to share his photographs to an exhibit or a book of some sort. And unfortunately, he passed away before I was able to do so. Um, so now I've been going back to the same village and finding the people that he's photographed and photographing them, some, some of them 30 years later, 40 years later. Uh, yeah. And it's great to see those side-by-side -side images. Um, and I've been really fortunate to have um, Steven Soderberg come on board to executive produce. So uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing this piece once it's completed. And maybe I can share it with you and your students. Oh, I would love it. Well, I was just going to suggest, uh, I was just going to suggest that you, you should talk with Kelly Grill and we should, I'd love to have some sort of a screening and, and, a, and a chat afterward at some point, if that's something you would be able to do. Yeah, I would love that. Um, people would, would really uh, benefit yeah. from that experience. Yeah. I love just documenting stories. And this was just somebody who, who, who was in a rural town a lot of these African photographers who have become really famous, like Seydou Keita and Malik Sidibe, were photographing in um, the capital cities or photographing people of the upper class. Uh, and Shibate's work was really of the working men. These were just, you know, farmers, uh, uh, tradesmen who worked with their hands. These weren't, you know, government officials or or just common, the common man. So it's really great to be able to see that section of folks in Uganda who are documented, because usually it's the people who have money or the people who are, you know, who could afford to pay a photographer to come and shoot them. But he really was able to document his, his whole small village over several mm -hmm. decades, so. I was really struck by uh, the fact that you said, when I go home. Mm. You know, you refer to that. That is that is home for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My mom is still there. Uh, okay. My dad passed away, but he's laid to rest there. And um, I just brought my family, my my wife um, Asha and our two kids back this last um, holiday, this last Christmas, and brought uh, about ten friends from LA as well. Oh, so really? Wow. I, I tried to rope Stan to come in coming but he, he couldn't get it together at the last minute but uh yeah, hopefully yeah. We'll you guys in next time oh god that would be so amazing yeah that would be that would be i mean please do hit me up for that yeah hopefully yeah. We'll over this hump sometime in the next few years oh uh, god i know god knows when it's going to happen you know yeah. you know i i think about what you had mentioned about going back and interviewing people some of them 30 years after the fact you know and the people have been photographed 30 years ago and that you're interviewing them now for this project uh, so much about them, you know, they've gotten older, their lives have changed too, but have you seen, have you seen change in the country that is yeah. documented through these, or reflected in these photographs? Yeah, even just the town mm -hmm. um, it was a single two lane street that was passing through the small town. And now they're planning to make it into a highway and they would actually wow. be destroying, demolishing where his photo studio was. So all the shops that were alongside the two-lane road are going to be removed. So they're giving money to all these folks to relocate. Um, so you wouldn't even recognize what was there before. Wow. Is it, will there be an effort to try to preserve his location? or? or I don't think so. Yeah. I, I don't think, yeah, it's, it's no, but that, that's what I'm trying to do with his, with his work, just mm. make sure his legacy continues. But uh, his studio is not, since he passed away in 2006, um, the studio is closed after he passed away. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of training did, did he have? Um, was he formally trained or was it someone who was self-taught? You know, he, he was primarily self-taught, but he was, he had worked under some other photographers before, but he didn't go to, you know, a conservatorship or a training school or anything. He was just somebody who had the love of this craft, um, which reminds me of, uh, you know, 
when we graduated, I went to somebody, a, a kid's a friend's graduation at Juilliard, not too long after we got out of school. And the commencement speaker said something like, there are those of you who will get out of here and within a year, you know, you will be uh, working busier than ever. And, you know, all these doors will be open to you that you never imagined. And you're, you know, things will just take off. And there's others of you who 10 years from now, the most, most work you will have done in your, in your field will have been in school. Uh, and then for the, the others, the rest of you, regardless of what happens, you will have to create. So whether the world is laid at your feet or there's no opportunities, you are the artists who, regardless of what happens, will always be creating something. And that really hit for me because I was like, I said, that's me. Because if I'm not acting or doing something, I'm shooting something. Or if, if I'm not, um, uh, you know, that's how I wrote a play. So I came out to LA and was hoping to do more film and television work. And things weren't working. Uh, you know, I was having a lot of downtime. And um, I, my uncle of mine was going through some really challenging times because he was HIV positive and was living illegally in the US. And I was like, you should you know, start recording your story or documenting it because this is people could learn from your experience. Mm -hmm. So I went and documented him, record with a tape recorder and just interviewed him. And from that, I created this play. But that happened because things were quiet on the film and television in front of me. I wouldn't have created that, you know, if I'd been so busy. So uh, for the students who watch this, um, I, I want to pass that on that, you know, there's a lot of people who like have like these hobbies who paint in their garage. No one ever sees their, sees their paintings, or, you know, and there may be students like that who have to create these characters or tell these stories, but we're no longer limited to the days of being in your garage and no one can see your stuff. With one click of a mouse, you know, or, if, or a click on your phone, you can share your stories or your, your vision across the globe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still blown away by that. And yeah. imagine if we'd had that in school when we were at the time, uh, like how that would have changed us. Um, I'm just, I'm, we're lucky because your tape from your soap opera class would have definitely been posted. <laughs> thank, thank God. Every day. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a tough, that would have been a real rough call for me. You know, it's, I, I, it's I, incredible it's time. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible yeah. time to be a kid, to be, to be an artist now. Yeah. Because your work, you can share it in a way that we could, that could not have been done for hundreds and thousands of years for artists. <laughs> Really, oh, it's yeah. the first time in, in our history, you know, that in the last 20 whatever years that this is even possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's the, someone referred to it on a podcast I was listening to recently as the de democratization of, uh, of art, uh, you know, be it filmmaking, songwriting, um, you know, performance, that you can do this what really is interesting to me. And I was thinking of this as I was drafting um, your introduction. Um, and based on your your bio and your credits online and things that God you have you have been able to pivot in so many different directions as a storyteller and it is all to me anyway it's all storytelling but you say, you know you haven't defined yourself as one thing and you've been able to just switch not only say I'm going to do this for myself but I'm not going to think of myself as only a photographer only an actor I'm a writer I'm a playwright you know a, a producer you know all of these facets of you. Um, that that is I can see that being inspiring to so many people. Well, as I said, it came out of necessity. You yeah, know? It wasn't like um, yeah, it came out of necessity. And I think when I came to LA, uh, I was selling my photographs to make money. Um, you know, I'd have some exhibits and I'd print up my images that I shot in Uganda, and that's how I made some money to get by and. I remember a friend of mine who worked at HBO got me a job to take the photographs of the president of HBO's daughter's, his, the president of HBO's um, daughter's birthday party. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> uh, 
so I'm there and it was at a bowling alley. And uh, I remember just, like, just taking pictures of this person. And I was like, I am this close to this person. And they just think of me as a photographer. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. They had no idea that I'd gone to crowd acting. Or, and I didn't want to be like, oh, by the way, I'm also an actor. Right. I didn't exactly. even say anything. Yeah. Um, and for a long time in LA, people just knew me as a photographer. So mm -hmm. that's kind of wild. Uh, and now, even now, um, I was at some function with these like really incredible filmmakers uh, who do this sort of avant-garde wor avant work and experimental stuff. And I was, I was just trying to plug myself into this conversation saying, yeah, I've made some short film. And they're like, who are you again? And I was like, oh, my name is Tara. You might have seen me on, I'm on this show, The Shy. And they're like, you know, I don't watch TV. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was yeah. Like, I was like, well, I'm just a TV actor. I was like, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it is the golden age of television, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, God. So, wow. you know, it's, but yeah, so I just keep pushing through and, and, uh, just grateful to be able to have different muscles and to be able to exercise. But you're the same way. I mean, you, I always saw you singing and I would try to open my mouth and it would just sound like a frog. <laughs> we all have our voice, man. I, 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 I tell, you know, I have to say, and for you, I mean, just the cabarets and the class and things too, nothing ever moved me more than, uh, and it's going to come out sounding not quite how I was intended, but uh, people who consider themselves non-singers, yeah. um, but to someone who doesn't sing, you know, um, sing. Yeah. Uh, that, to me, I, I remember having to leave leave the classroom when you or other people, like, I, I won't name names, but, but when people would get up and bare their soul through singing, mm -hmm. pushing through the fear and all the technical crap that you have to think of and tell a story from the heart, that to me is raw and real and powerful. I can listen to I can listen to a beautiful voice, a trained a trained singer, a singer's singer all day, and not have that experience. You know, mm -hmm. um, so there's something I think that people seem to recognize. I recognize it in you, not only in your acting, but in your in in singing class, mm -hmm. um, but also through your photographs. And certainly your work on, 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 on film and television, and particularly as Ronnie and The Shy, which if you guys haven't seen it, you just go ahead and get Showtime and watch because he is incredible. The show is incredible and you're, you're missing out. Um, and I don't want you to miss out. Um, so, and Tade, I think people recognize that in you, you know, early on someone says, oh, you can go to the head of was the HBO and, you know, take pictures. There's a confidence that people have in you that you're going to pull something out of that is, that is worthwhile. You know, um, that you're not going to let them down in some way in whatever medium you seem to be working in. So mm -hmm. I think that's why you get these incredible opportunities now that, you know, that that um, in, in, in particularly in recent years. And, and it's so gratifying to see that you're recognized on a on a larger scale, you know. Thank you, um because you're probably the only one to recognize that in school. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know that that's true. I, you, I, I, I don't know. I yeah. hope that's not true. I know you, that. You say you had to walk out of the room. Thank you for kind of couching in the terms of. No, no. I mean, it's just, it's that, that is to me, because I, I don't know. You, you may recognize me as uh, someone who was pretty shut down, um, you know, uh, or, or someone who, was, who had a veneer of, of BS that, that uh, I would keep in front of me as much as I could. Um, but when that was threatened, when that was challenged uh, by experiences like the one I described to you, um, I could not stay in the room. I had have to leave the room, you know, and, and go have my experience <laughs> in a corner somewhere. You yeah. know, it was hard, but that, that to me is, th those were the, the trigger moments that we talk about now where it came through that, that, that sense of authenticity, that honesty in the work, that, that rawness um, and the bravery that you, that you showed in your work. So uh, I, I don't want to embarrass you uh, um, uh, about that, but that was something that I, I, those are the moments that I'm most grateful for. And those are the reasons when I think of those experiences that uh, I, I, I say, I'm so glad I went. Wouldn't do a day of it over again, but I'm so glad I went because that's what has informed me going forward. And that's what I'm hoping I, I, I can push my students to encourage them to to strive for those experiences too you know yeah yeah that's great they're lucky to have you man. 
Well, uh, and, and yours, your, yours, you as well. I want to go out and, and take your class and free play, man. And that is, that would be good for my soul. Okay. I'm, I, Tati, I'm just kind of looking ahead here. I say we got a few more minutes before we have to take questions, but I, um, I wanted to just um, one thing I, I do remember back in, in, and I had to look up the date of it too. The National Tour of Six Degrees of, of Separation, for which you received a Helen Hayes nomination, if I my memory serves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elaine and I, my wife and I, um, saw you in I think it was Stanford, Connecticut. Oh, wow. in that in that production, it was it with Marlowe. Tom? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And who was, was it? Was it John Cunningham as well in that, or who was the? No, John Cunningham did it in New York, uh, and we had. I cannot remember. That's so long. Ago. I remember you and Marlo Thomas because I saw her as a kid on TV. But yeah. I, I'll say this: that people uh, coming out of that that theater. Uh, was it? Who is that guy? <laughs> who the hell is that guy? We're waiting back to say, Lynn, I would go, you know, went back and waited for you and chatted after the show mm-hmm. too. Uh, but it's it's something that people were just so blown away. And the play is a really, I think, a tremendous play and really interesting in many ways. But but people just, man, that guy, that guy. And this is Stanford. You know, the people who go to New York and see things too. And mm-hmm. that was so soon after you finished school that it was, it was uh, my first. Yeah, that was my I, first job right out of school. Not a, you, not a bad you, start. You had a first huge first job right out of school too. You couldn't have done better than that. Uh, I have, I was pretty lucky. I was yeah. pretty lucky. Man. Not lucky. Um, that was talent, my friend. Um, thank you, thank you. You know, I think we we both been around a long time. And for myself, though, I have my the big asterisk on uh, that'll always be under my name is that I left the business for twenty years. You yeah. know, I, I left the business a long time ago and raised my family. And kind of uh, recent years, yeah. was invited back in, um, but. Uh, you have been at it for a long time. And I think just like the challenges with NYU, as you were talking about sort of feeling like an outsider and having to invent things for yourself, having to be perhaps entrepreneurial uh, uh, in any way you could be to kind of keep your art flowing and to keep yourself going and fed. I, I think perhaps these, you know, I, I, I wonder if these aren't experiences that just sort of that you bring with you into the work that you're doing now on the shy or the things that it informs you in some way um, that had you had an easier time in NYU, you know, I wish the hell you had. And if we could go back, I would insist on this if it took my little voice, you know, but, um, but there is something that seems to come from those experiences that um, I don't know. It seems to have made you really strong. Yeah, and, well, and a, the next guy may not be. No, there's a there's a, there's a funny book this comedian or this guy wrote. I don't think he's a comedian, but a journalist. What doesn't kill you makes you blacker. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, that is great. <laughs> that is great. That is great for all of us. <laughs> I am going to have to uh, hit that one up on Amazon when I read it off. It's like, that sounds good. Like a, a book, a must read for me. Wow. You know, you, you've been around and it just kind of, uh, I won't say it cracks me up because it kind of astounds me, but to hear you still now referred to as a breakout performer, like, yeah, you, 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 you break out of the cast. You, you pop in, in these casts that you are involved with these projects, too. But you've been at it for so long. And, and, I, and I imagine your versatility and your flexibility and your creativity in all these different directions has, has uh, you know, held, kept you, kept you uh, going. No, I feel really lucky. And you know how things can change. You know, it could be a breakout right now and then a flop the next one. Right. Um, but how things change and, you know... We were just talking about how you were out of the business for so long, and then next thing you know, you're starring on a TV show. Uh, mm-hmm. So we never know what tomorrow will bring, and the challenge as artists is really is to just be present and try to ride that moment when it comes, and because mm-hmm. uh, you never know what's going to be next. And uh, I just, you know, especially now, I feel for the students who are who are 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 just about to graduate or just graduated because these are unprecedented times you know yeah. there's not yeah. there's no production happening really there's very little production so it's forcing you the students really to re-examine themselves and it goes back to what i was talking about the juilliard kids because the, 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 the commencement speech because uh, you have to create <laughs> You have to create and find your own unique voice and share that. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, there's no greater time right now than right. to be able to do that. And we have, in a weird way, we have a lot of time on our hands to, to do these things too. I have so many friends who are, you know, showrunners and writers, producers, and so they're, they're just kind of getting getting things loaded up, teeing up that script that they've been dreaming about. You know, Dave mm-hmm. Zabel, our classmate and good friend, mm-hmm. being one of them, uh, getting things off the ground that, that they didn't have time to do before. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I hope and trust that there's going to be an explosion of, of opportunities, but new material for, for other artists to work on too. For sure, um, we will be. This is going to be, yeah. we're going to look back at this time and just be astounded by yeah. the tremendous change that occurred in this time period. Right. right. Yeah. When, 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 the, uh, when the printing press uh, came up, there was an explosion of creativity around that as well. Maybe this will be in some perverse way, <laughs> another explosion of creativity, another, another oh, golden yeah. age. You know? I think so, for sure. It's happening. This enforced leisure time that we have, yeah. creative time. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of people who um, w- tune into this series um, who are students, who are aspiring performers or artists in general. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, all of our uh, all of our artists, um, you know, this question. What do you know now as an artist that you wish you knew when you started? That's a great question. Well, there was a thing that they posted on the board at NYU in the hallway. Uh, where we just post stuff on uh, people, alumni who are doing gigs. Uh, and there's just little things, but the top of the board just said, believe. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. believe. You got to have part of this is just having faith. Uh, and, or if you don't have faith, <laughs> just leap. <laughs> Because just to talk about my work on The Shy, it was a role that I never thought I was right for. Because um, we never, I never did a role like that. You mm-hmm. know, somebody who was doing August Wilson plays or something might have had a chance to exercise those muscles, but I never did. And so I didn't take it really seriously when I had the audition. So I was like, I don't have a shot at this. Um, and then the fourth, third, fourth audition, I was like, what? <laughs> Somebody's seeing something. I have no idea what they're... And even when I got the job, we were filming it and I was like, and they were replacing some actors and I was like, I'm just waiting for them to replace me one day. Mm-hmm. It's gonna happen. Somehow I didn't get replaced. And then when the show was about to come out, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna get slammed in the reviews. It's gonna be, they're gonna just see it. It's just a total like, and then to get singled out and mentioned in the, a lot of the press for the show, I was totally, that, that we, you know, transform my sort of nature of creativity. Because I, I just realized you don't have to necessarily believe all the time, too. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do it. Yeah. yeah. Hit your marks and say just the lines. Do it. <laughs> try not to get in the way. Try yeah. not to do extra stuff. Just try to keep it. And I guess if the other word, if you were to say, is... Um, uh, Instead of what would I knew, know, what would I, what do I know now that I wish I'd known then, which is you know, simplicity is a virtue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if ever you hit a wall, if you ever feel stuck, just remember simplicity is a virtue and try to go back to the basics and keep it simple. Yeah. I love it. Believe, just do it in simplicity. That 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 is that is bedrock foundational stuff that I, I I hope people are listening to and hear. And guys, if you have a pen, write it down on your hand. You know, that's the kind that, of stuff that, that someone says, and it's like it's hard to do. You just have to you have to have that experience to realize you have to fall and get up and fall uh, before you just sort of understand that. Because yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's. That is that is awesome stuff, and it, it is those sort of those brief those those little nuggets of things that will come back. I and mean, even if you guys don't write about it, you know, to our audience, even if you don't write it down, at some point, Toddy's words are going to come to you when you're stuck, and you're going to say, "I'm going to try that thing I heard because it's such a, a great solid piece of advice." Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have a few, um, just a few uh, minutes left for some questions. Would you mind taking a few? Oh, I'd be happy to. All right, great. I'm going to actually pull my little. Oh, here we go. I've got it. I've got it. Um, uh, so for, this is from Kate. What advice would you give to young acting students just starting out? What are the some do's and don'ts as far as education and acting goes? Um, well, I would just go back to what I was talking about before. That This is a really unique time where you 
can create and not create in a vacuum and you can collaborate with other folks and not do it in a vacuum because of this format. Uh, we, when I was in school with Jerry, we'd had to like make a phone call, agree we we're gonna go to 721 Broadway to rehearse or do something to figure out the schedules and it was just, and now we can talk and we can brainstorm and share ideas, you know, in different time zones. Um, and we can create, uh, not just this conversation, but um, create stories. So I think for many, many of you, you've already grown up with this, so you might take it for granted. Uh, but now that we're in this sort of, sort of lockdown phase, I think it's really an incredible time to look at oneself and what are the stories you wanna tell? Who are the collaborators you find? And when I've worked with folks like, you know, Soderbergh or David Simon on Treme, and you look at the people that they have, their teams of people, there's this misnomer that it's one person at the top. They have like Simon, David Simon has like 20 or 30, like an army of people that he's worked with for the past 20 years. Hmm. Soderbergh is the same thing. He has a group of people that he's worked with, the collaborators that he's worked with for years. Uh, and now if you're in school and you have a connection with someone, uh, work that. Because it's hard to find that. I know Jerry, you really connected with Stan. And mm -hmm. I know you guys have done stuff together and created music together. Mm -hmm. That's a rare thing to have when you find someone like that and to try to create stuff with. So for the students who are just starting out, find your army and go out and you know create and break down walls and tell your own stories from your particular voice. And don't wait for something to be handed to you. Because uh, a lot of the people who are breaking out, Issa Rae, even Lena Waithe, uh, a lot of these people were creating YouTube videos, shooting stuff on their, you know, really cheap production. And now they have like these empires on television. <laughs> but they started out creating their own stuff. Just a little bit of resource. Everybody has that resource in their pocket these days or in their hand too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the money, the money comes later. The money comes later. And, but the, what you have to say is everything, right? That's, that's wonderful. Um, Caitlin asks, what do you prefer uh, most, uh, uh, more, a acting or photography? I know that's a tough one. Yeah, and are I photographs don't... available for, for us to see somewhere? I think you may have shared a link. Yeah, I don't have a, I love both. And if I'm not doing one, I'm doing the other. Uh, but I know with photography, it's something that I'll, I can do at any time, but with acting, it's uh, the theater or film and television is the most collaborative art form there is. You know, it requires so many people to, to tell a story with in film and television and theater, unless you're doing solo pieces or really, really scaled back productions. Um, but with photography, it's just me and my camera. So... I know I'll be doing that till whenever, at all times, um, but acting is, it doesn't happen at my own, you know, whim at the, you know, mm -hmm. it's far in between. Yeah, stay busy making and creating, right? Yeah. Um, so this is from Ethan. Um, what would you say your best experience as an actor is and why? Um, I don't know that I have single one single one, but I would know one of the most memorable or impactful things for me was the, uh, the play that I wrote called Biru, which was based on my uncle who was HIV positive uh, and living illegally in the US. And I went and documented his story, as I said, and wrote this play based on his life and premiered it at the National Theater in Uganda. And then from there, it went to the London and then it was at the Public Theater in New York. and. And it was a solo play, so that it just blew me away that you know I could put a pen to paper based on these interviews I did with my uncle, and that that story would travel so far and wide. Um, and I had never written a thing before in my life. I never written a play. Um, that was really, really impactful, and it came when I, as I mentioned before, we were talking earlier when I was trying to get film and television work and that wasn't open, the doors were closed. I was maybe getting two 
TV, three, two or three TV jobs a year, episodics, which is nothing. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, I'm not talking recurring roles. It's just like one episode, one spot, job, yeah. another episode. Yeah. Maybe yeah. two or three times a year. That would be a great year. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had all this time in between and I was, that's how I created this piece. So as an actor, that was one of the most amazing things because it was something that I gave birth to. Um, and I would have to say another big impactful thing was The Shy um, because that was my first time starring on a series, um, the, the lead role in a series. And, and as I was saying just earlier, that it was something where it was like having an out-of-body experience because I was saying these words but not having something, you know, I didn't feel like I owned them. Uh, But people would come up to me and say they were moved by the performance or, you know, hit them in a way. But that wasn't something that I was feeling when I was saying it at the time. (laughs) So that just also just transformed my creative process because I was like, yeah, just keep it simple. Say the words and the writing is there sometimes mm-hmm. it was just to open your mouth and, and let be a vessel. I love it. I love it. I, w- I want people to know that uh, you can see in Tati's work, his, his photography on Guma, uh, Guma Design, G-U-M-A design.com. So please take a look there. Please take a look at his IMDB page or his Wikipedia. Take a look at his canon of work. Go back and see his films, his television shows. Um, you really uh, owe it to yourself. If you want to see, uh, have a real master class in, in performance, that's the way to do it, is to see an actor like him. And I, I say this in Tade, I think, you know, your story about how you, uh, right from Zoom, your Zoom audition, right through to your shy audition, I think people recognize they're getting the real deal in you. And perhaps it is something about sort of the lack of control that you felt that you experienced with playing Ronnie with something, maybe that's the very thing that they needed. And it's a character that seems to not be in control of his circumstances. He's not the master of his own fate. And I think that that's what resonates with me in watching you in that role. Um, and that perhaps that's something that resonates uh, going through, but I just know that there's a real humanity and a basic fundamental goodness about you as a human being, as an artist, and that people want to pay attention to and learn from and, and filter their own experiences through. Um, so I want to thank you for all of your amazing work, regardless of the media, and and uh, and say congratulations on all of it. And thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Thank you for reaching out. I know you have a, a Rolodex that runs deep. <laughs> for you to reach out to me to include me in this means the world, my friend. And you look exactly the same as you did. Uh, Way back 30 years ago. <laughs> I'm shocked. You still got those curls. Do you put dye in your hair? <laughs> no, there's no dye yet. <laughs> there, are, there are plenty of grays. It depends on the light. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I'll appoint people to an IMDb the photograph, one of the images on his website, on imdb.com, of Entare doing, I'm not going to even say how old we are, uh, but doing pull-ups in this scene. And he, and I believe you insisted, you told me this a, a year or so ago, that you insisted, take the whole photograph, don't do nothing from the chest up. Really doing this photograph, and he's jacked. So, man, you look like, I won't even say 30 years ago, it looks like it was 40, 45 years ago. You look like well, a teenager. Well, that's what, having to take your clothes off on camera will make you have to do. <laughs> well, I, I saw that in the script, I was like, I prepared like two months just for that five minute scene. <laughs> no one's asking me to do that these days, man. Good for you. Good on you, man. Hey, I love you and thank you so thank much. You, Todd. Thank you for having me. Thanks again. Blessings to all your students. And, you know, this is an incredible time, guys. You're lucky to have Jerry. And I can't wait to see you guys create and um, keep me posted. We will. We will. Thank you, my friend. All right.